All right, we're live now. Looks like okay. Looks like we're live. And the chat room is open. And I think everybody is here. So I'm just going to well, let's we'll see. All right, yep. 10 seconds live, 11 seconds we're live. All right. Well, <clears throat> everyone just want to go ahead and uh, welcome everyone to Healing X Outreach. And let me make sure that we're, we're everything. I want to double check to make sure we're, we're, okay, we're good. We're good. All righty. And I'm actually going to say, Hello there. And this. Alrighty, cool. <clears throat> well, uh, I think the title says it all. Uh, I'm doing this in response to Mike and Kim, particularly Mikey's recent review of. Dr. Paul Copan's book is God a Moral Monster. And there is a reason why I'm doing this. <laughs> There's always a reason why I'm doing whatever I'm doing. First of all, I had Dr. Paul Copan as a guest. I believe it was a year ago. Maybe less than it. No, probably a couple months ago. Before I ended the podcast. <clears throat> and um, um, one of Mike and Kim's uh, subscribers named Bonnie the Atheist, who's very close to them, and actually is probably responsible for uh, getting Michael Coogan's book into Mikey's hands, is likely the person responsible for getting this book into Mikey's hands. And Bonnie had been trolling my channel for a while, and and I believe it, I, we had some good conversations in the comments section. <clears throat> but then um, she would dis distract from the videos and be lengthy and uh, was really just seeking attention. That's what it was. And not actually staying on topic. So I had to block her. I deleted her. I think I deleted one of her comments. It was yay long and I had to block her and that's what I do with people that don't stay on topic on the videos and uh, but I've had actually as of late really good dialogue in the comments section and so this purpose in doing this is that I know that Mike Mikey's uh, review book review if we could call it that was because someone, either Bonnie or somebody else, but I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, re, uh, realistically, I believe it was Bonnie. <clears throat> and when he did this 45-minute book review, if we could even call it that, um, he actually covered maybe five topics, but I'm going to cover four, four of what I took notes on from Mike's review, which had nothing, zero, zilch, nothing to do with Paul Copan's book. And what he did was, first of all, he tried to accuse Paul Copan of acting like the Watchtower. And actually, no, Paul Copan wasn't acting like the Watchtower, but Mikey's so-called review was exactly the kind of thing the Watchtower Society has done in its publications. For one, one publication really comes to mind about what Mikey did, and that is the Trinity brochure, where they went quoting the early church fathers and were really taking them out of context and trying to say the early church fathers were saying this as opposed to what they were really actually saying. 
And so there are two words that I want you to uh, memorize and probably if you want to use it in your vocabulary. Because these are two words that really apply to the cults. They definitely apply to the Watchtower Society. And they definitely apply to Mikey and his so-called book review. And the words are proof text and eisegesis. And it's not I see Jesus. <laughs> That's not the meaning for eisegesis. But a proof text is when you take a small snippet, which is what Mikey did, and then you try to change the direction of the author on that small snippet. You say the author was intending to do this with that small snippet. And we're going to cover some of Mikey's proof text and his lack of a review of Paul Copan's book. And I have in the description below not only a list of resources about this, about many of the stuff we're going to cover, but the podcast, you can see it on YouTube, which was actually audible by podcast. And I, I put the link below in the description so that you can hear me and Dr. Paul Colpan actually do a real book review and talk about the contents and the substance of his book. And then I think the last 10 or 15 minutes of the podcast, Bonnie comes on. And actually, you know, it was good in, in the beginning. Bonnie was was good. I, I love people that ask my guest questions. But then she got unhinged and started attacking Dr. Copan instead of sticking to the questions she had, which was great. It was great. I, I, I had no problem with her challenging Dr. Copan on, on his subject. But she, she got unhinged. So, Mikey's distractions, not addressing the book, were these four in particular. He had took issue with Paul Coban's saying the author of Hebrews and not saying whether it was Paul or someone else. Now, there is a constituency of people within the Christian church. Uh, some people say Paul didn't write the book of Hebrews, and some people say he did. But Paul Copan's book wasn't about the canonicity or legitimacy of who the author of the book of Hebrews was. But Mikey devoted some time on those little snippets of Paul Copan referring to the book of Hebrews uh, authorship as the author of Hebrews instead of naming out who he believed was the author of Hebrews. We're going to discuss that. <clears throat> the second thing that Mikey did was he took issue with Joshua's curse and the fulfillment. Was Joshua's curse fulfilled or wasn't it? We're going to take a look at what Mikey actually said about Joshua's curse in Era. An era, and why Joshua's curse did find fulfillment. And we're going to talk about Rahab the harlot and her continual reference, his continual reference actually, that should be, to her critical position in the genealogy of Jesus. Why is it important to Mikey, uh, who was trying to say that it was important to Christianity, that Rahab's genealogy be intact. <clears throat> and the last thing we're going to take a look at is Jericho's invasion as a previous conquest by others, but who? So Mikey asserts that Jericho was invaded before Joshua, and he doesn't tell us who it was. And he insists that it was, and we're going to know why he insists and why he went on this four distraction tangent instead of addressing the book. And the title of the book is, is God a Moral Monster, which right, Mikey never got around to. 
He never got around to the substance of the book, which I have right here. If you see me in the little screen, this is his book. And I will read some things in the table of comment, contents that he could have discussed, even if he had issues with it. He could have discussed it and gotten to a legitimate review instead of a tangent. And I think he went on the tangent was because he really could not debunk the book. I think that and the substance of the book might have been over his head. And he doesn't want to admit it. Uh, Paul Copan has a PhD in philosophy. He's a brilliant man. And you can listen to the podcast. Now, <clears throat> Mikey has a new Bible. All right. And it's Michael Coogan's The Old Testament, a historical and literary introduction into the Hebrew scriptures. And Michael Coogan is a Harvard liberal. And Michael Coogan, Coogan is has no problem revealing that he has a bias into his biblical archaeology and chronology. In his interview by Ryan Coles called What I Want to Know, dated August 13, 2011, he states, the text is not, except perhaps in the abstract, intrinsically authoritative. It derives its authority, authority from the community. He favors thinking of the Bible in a more nuanced way than simply as the literal word of God and identifies the Bible as one foundational text in American society, which along with our Constitution must be interpreted critically. <clears throat> so, Mikey, who has done this with the Bible, it's just paper and ink has a new Bible. Because, see, Mikey couldn't do a book review of this book here, Paul Copan's Is God a Moral Monster, without going into his Bible. Which his Bible, which is a textbook, because Mikey finally read one book by one author and that he agrees with. He finds that one author and that one scholar, because remember... Months ago, he was saying the scholars blow smokes, smoke up your skirts. But in Mikey's new Bible, he found a scholar, and he goes to it authoritatively every time when he wants to assess another book or anybody else's opinions. Because no doubt, Michael D. Coogan is inspired. Now, Let's talk about Mikey's distraction. The number one distraction is the author of Hebrews and its canonicity. Copan's book is not about who authored Hebrews. And giving an unbiased reference that does not say which side he is on that debate is not some watchtower tactic like Mikey assumes. You see, in Christianity, you can actually disagree on a lot of things. And the authorship of Hebrews, you can disagree on. Whichever side Dr. Paul Gopan falls on about the author of Hebrews, it's not a dividing point for Christians, nor the canon of the New Testament. But Mikey, you got to understand, operates upon the notion that everything is a dividing point because as Jehovah's Witnesses now, everything was a dividing point. And in that respect, Mikey is the one, not Paul Copan, who still imitates the Watchtower cult. Because he thinks, because Paul Copan describes Hebrews' writer as the author of Hebrews and doesn't come out right and says, Paul is the writer or whoever Paul Copan believes is the writer, that all of a sudden he has something to hide and that he's being duplicitous and evil and wicked. So who authored the book of Hebrews? Whichever side you fall on is up to you. And it doesn't detract from the book's entrance into the canon. In fact, here's a link, and there's going to be links underneath in the description where you can see where people divide on who the author of Hebrews are. 
people in the West, people in the ancient church, people in, and, and currently, who they believe wrote the book of Hebrews. It doesn't matter a hill of beans to me or to any Christian of any knowledgeable work. You can believe Hebrews was written by Luke. Some people believe it was written by Luke. Some people believe that Paul had a ghostwriter. Some people believe it was Paul. Some people believe it was Clement of Rome. There are lots of people who believe that the author of Hebrews were different people. The ancient church leaned more towards the apostle Paul. There are reasons for that. I lean to Paul, but it doesn't make or break me if you believe it's somebody else. Mikey's distraction number two is a faulty assumption about Joshua's curse. In Mikey's book review, which wasn't a book review, <laughs> Mikey talked about Paul Copan and trying to avoid Joshua's curse. Well, Mikey's faulty assumption, here goes the curse, let me give it to you. It's in Joshua 6.26. Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. Now, Mikey's faulty assumption was that Joshua declared the city would not be rebuilt. Well, if you read the text, Joshua doesn't say that Jericho won't be rebuilt. What Joshua does say was that the person who rebuilt it will be judged by the loss of his firstborn son and youngest son. Now, Mikey goes into a discussion of who it was, was the builder. It's a guy named Hael, who was a Bethelite. And for some reason, Mikey thought a lot of things were really funny about Paul Copan's book. And he would give out a nice little evil cacophony of laughter, which I don't think is funny. There was nothing that was funny in his review. There was no satire. There was nothing comedic. He just felt laughing was a, a good remedy to his ego. So, Hael either sacrificed his sons, which some believe, or they were killed in some natural disaster during the build. The former fits the entirety of the verses in verses 30 through 33 in Joshua. And concerning the pagan practice instituted by Ahab and taking place in Israel. Now, Mikey, for some reason, thinks Israel uh, was worshiping uh, Yahweh as Baal and his Yahweh as Satan diatribe things that he came out with. Uh, the fact is, when you read 1 Kings 16, verses 30 through 33, it pretty much tells you that this was an evil period of time and Hiel's rebuilding of Jericho is included as part of a longer passage describing the evil that took place during King Ahab's reign in Israel. Ahab took a pagan non-Jewish wife named Jezebel. He worshipped her god Baal. Ahab had a temple of Baal built in the capital city of Samaria and erected an Ashereth pole. And the conclusion of this account is that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. During this wicked time, Hiel disregarded Joshua's curse and rebuilt Jericho. Now, did Hiel sacrifice his sons, possibly to Baal? Possibly he did. Wouldn't that fit the whole line of, of, of 1 Kings 16, 30-33, of all the evil that Ahab has started and bringing false worship, wouldn't it fit that Hael would have sacrificed his sons to the god Baal? Is this an is this a a chastisement to the god Yahweh or Jehovah? Of course it isn't. But Mikey, of course, doesn't make that association in this book because this whole thing is a distraction from actually the substance of Paul Copan's book. Because Paul Copan is not going on a tangent about the curse Joshua made, which actually came to fulfillment 500 years later. So, somebody did die 
building the city. That is, their children died building the city. And why would Joshua have a curse as if Joshua was a prophet or a holy man or or he shouldn't have a curse or because cursing is bad? You know, there are a lot of things about the Old Testament that we don't understand culturally. And, and you know, if you went to China, you would really be distracted by the fact that how cold it seems that the Chinese people, how a little child could get hit by a car and people would walk right over the corpse. The Eastern culture operates differently culturally. And if anything you learn from Dr. Paul Copan's book, Is God a Moral Monster?, is that the Israelites were actually native Canaanites. And so they were pretty much still savage in many ways. And God is trying to give them a law. He's trying to tame them. He's trying to civilize them. But it's difficult. In fact, most of Israel's history is plundered in pagan worship and disobedience to the God Yahweh. So, the faulty assumption of Mikey was that the city wouldn't be built? Well, that's not what the text says. If you know how to read English, it's pretty clear what the text says. Now, Mikey's distraction number three. Rahab the harlot and his continual reference to her critical position in the genealogy of Jesus. He says it's important to Christianity that Rahab the harlot's genealogy be intact because her genealogy in the book of Matthew, is mentioned as one of Jesus' descendants. But you know what? I don't think that Mikey was really emphasizing her genealogy as being important to Christians. I think it was more important to Mikey. You see, Mikey, a couple months ago, teased that he was going to go ahead and talk about a book called Caesar's Messiah, by a computer programmer called Joseph Atwell. And Joseph Atwell comes from a position called Jesus Mythicism. And out of all the Jesus Mythicists, which is only a handful in the world today, that is a handful of, I guess, authored Jesus Mythicists, they believe Jesus never existed. But out of all of them, Atwell is the furthest to the left of Jesus' mythicists. In fact, those that are more scholarly in the Jesus' mythicism movement actually distance themselves and criticize Atwell in his book. Uh, the other guy, which Mikey, of course, clamors to about Jesus never existing, which, by the way, Kimmy, uh, in your Three Points to Dawn's video, you mentioned that you and Mikey don't, that you actually believe Jesus and Moses existed. And, or maybe it was just you. But I want to say this. Jesus said those who uh, how is the scriptures those who who are uh, who are, are will not distance him, themselves from him you know will be have an audience with his father in heaven now the thing is this guy right here you see that bald guy and you see that that's Sammy Davis jr and that is Anton LeBay now this is there in the younger years no doubt Sammy Davis Jr., I think, is long gone. And Anton LaVey passed away a couple of years ago. But this guy, the bald head guy, was a guest on Mike and Kim's uh, YouTube channel. And the bald head guy is a guy named Jordan Maxwell. His actual, his real name is Russell Pine. And Russell Pine, who fraternizes with Satanists, Anton LaVey, was the head of the Satanist church. Sammy Davis Jr. was a Satanist. And a guy who actually borrows his teachings from Luciferians, Jordan Maxwell, gets his teachings from 
Elena Blavatsky, who's a Luciferian, and claims to have had friendship with Manly P. Hall, who's a Freemason and Luciferian, is also a Jesus mythicist and does not believe Moses existed and doesn't believe Jesus existed. So really, it's important to Mikey that Rahab, the harlot, is not historical. That what happened at Jericho didn't happen because if it did happen, then Jesus has a genealogy that is legitimate and legitimately claimed in the Gospel of Matthew. So, why did Mikey bring up this issue of Rahab being a harlot? Well, because a small minutiae detail in Paul Copan's book, where Paul basically did, you know, floundered around with the fact that Rahab had a couldn't have had a brothel. You know, he was going over overboard. Whether Rahab had a brothel where she was prostituting herself, we do know that it was also a hotel or a hostel. Why that makes a difference to this book, Is God a Moral Monster? Making Sense of the Old Testament God? It doesn't. It's just another rabbit trail, another distraction from Mikey, because he can't deal with the substance of Paul Copan's book on dealing whether if Yahweh is really a moral monster. So he has to take issue with Paul Copan playing fast and loose with Rahab the harlot, having either a hotel or there being residents in the city of Jericho. Which leads us to number four, Mikey's distraction number four, Jericho's invasion as a previous conquest by others. Well, in the uh, comments section, in the description section, there are several videos and articles there that really talks about the original archaeologists on the dig. The two archaeologists, the earlier is John Garstang and the later is Kathleen Kenyon. And John Garstang and Kathleen Kenyon, 1930s and 50s, headed the archaeological digs. Kathleen Kenyon came after Garstang. And they both had a difference in the dating of the cities. So the double city wall Garstang associated with the Israelite invasion in about 1400 BCE. In fact, dated it to the early Bronze Age, some 1,000 years earlier. The destruction of Garstang City, which he had dated to about 1400 BCE, occurred according to Kenyon, Kathleen Kenyon, at the end of the middle of the Bronze Age, about 1550 BCE. Now, there are some other people that have other evidence concerning this that disagree with Michael Coogan and uh, uh, Mikey's new Bible. Because Mikey thinks Michael Coogan is the end-all, be-all of all archaeology. But there are lots of archaeologists. You just heard of two that, you, that, you know, John Garsting and Kathleen King, the people who were actually digging at the sites of Jericho. So, apart from this dating difference, which does make a huge difference. We have to remember that archaeological scholars have been wrong many a time. For a long time, archaeological scholars like Michael Coogan believed that King David did not exist. And then archaeology proved he did exist. So to debunk one of Mikey's issues, which is which would have been number five, is Hammurabi's Law Code, which Mikey takes issue with the fact that Paul Copan talks about that similar stories occurred in Hammurabi's Law Code, which, by the way, Hammurabi's Law Code comes from the ancient Sumerians, the oldest civilization known to men. And, uh, and some of Moses' commandments imitate 
Hammer Rabbi's Law Code and imitate some of the Egyptian laws. As the Egypt once had monotheism. And of course it did, because Egypt had Jewish influence. The slaves were once residents, and they abided there civilized with the Egyptians. As anybody knows about the story of Joseph, who was once a ruler in Egypt, and his family grew in Egypt, and eventually the pharaohs forgot that these Hebrews were native to them, befriended them, and then enslaved them. But here is the correlation between the archaeological evidence and the biblical narrative, and it's substantial. Apart from this dating difference, the site by which Kathleen Kenyon and John Garstang, and now even more recent archaeological digs, have revealed that the city was strongly fortified, just as Joshua writes. The attack occurred just after harvest, just after harvest time in the spring, just as the biblical narrative of Joshua writes. The inhabitants had no opportunity to flee with their foodstuffs. In fact, they found jars of food at the archaeological digs, just as Joshua writes. The siege was short, just as Joshua writes. The walls were leveled, possibly by an earthquake, just as Joshua writes. The city was not plundered, just as Joshua writes, and the city was burned. And they found pottery with, with burns on them, just as Joshua writes. Of course, Mikey tries to attribute that to early invasions, but he doesn't mention who was the invaders. And you know why? Because no one knows. It wasn't the Egyptians. Recent evidence proves that it wasn't. And I have in the description, you can go ahead and see some of the new evidence about the digs at Jericho. Now, AI, Jesus said that if they remain silent, the very stones will cry out. And in archaeology, we're finding they are crying out. They are crying out, and they support the biblical narrative. Now, there is a archaeologist that writes, and we'll go through him, and he was at the site at Kerbet el Makator, which is the site which they believe is Aeon. And you see in this picture a huge pile of stones, which actually gives credence to Joshua 8.29. And he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. And at sunset, Joshua gave command, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the city gate and raised over it a great heap of stones that stands to this day. This heap of stones is a most exciting and persuasive piece of evidence. And yes, if it stood to this day then, it's still standing to, the, to this day now at the site at Kerbet el Makator, affirming Joshua's account of the conquering of Ai. Now, who was it that was, who was on that dig at Ai? It's Dr. Bryant G. Wood. And yes, there are other scholars who disagree with Michael Coogan. Dr. Bryant G. Wood attended Syracuse Univ University graduated with a B.S. in mechanical engineering, later earning an M.S. in mechanical engineering from Renaissance Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. He later pursued biblical and archaeological studies and received an M.A. in biblical history from the University of Michigan in 1974 and a Ph.D. in Syro-Palestinian archaeology from the University of Toronto. He is a specialist in Canaanite pottery of the late Bronze Age and worked at the dig for al at Kabet el makator which is known as Ai, and he has written extensively about Jericho and about the pottery they found there, which he dates to 1400 as opposed to 1550, a thousand years before Coogan and other secular 
archaeologists would date it. Dr. Gerald E. Ardsma is a biblical chronologist, and he has a B PhD in nuclear physics from the University of Toronto. His PhD studies worked in the newly found field of accelerator mass spectrometry, a field which is now widely employed for radiocarbon and other rare isotope dating methods. Wow, isn't that interesting? We're talking about radiocarbon and rare isotope dating methods. How useful would that be in archaeology? Well, it is very useful. In fact, Dr. Ardsma says physical dating methods such as radiocarbon play an important role in the construction of historical chronologies. Uh, Dr. Ardsma, who I have recently gotten in contact with one of his, I guess, one of his people, and I hope to possibly do some, do a program with Dr. Ardsma. But um, he uh, talks about the dating method, which many archaeologists use today, which ironically coincides with early creationism, early earth creationism, which was another area which Mikey got wrong. Because, see, early earth creationism doesn't say that man has been on the earth for 6,000 years. Wrong, Mikey. Early earth creationism says that man has been on the earth for 10,000 years. Now, I'm not an early, early earth creationist, but uh, Dr. Gerald E. Ardsma actually says that uh, many biblical, many archaeologists today use an early earth creationist method of dating these biblical sites. And he's trying to get away from that. And that's why he believes there is a dating issue I would imagine Dr. Brian G. Wood also is getting away from that. Uh, and I forgot the name of the um, the dating method, but uh, but it comes from around the medieval era. Dr. James Hoffmeyer is another archaeologist. He dabbles into the comedic text of Egypt, and he got his Ph.D. from the University of Toronto. I own both of these books by Dr. James Hoffmeyer. The Archaeology of the Bible is a what would be a college textbook in archaeology, much like Dr. Michael Coogan's book. And he wrote his book, Israel in Egypt, The Evidence for the Authenticity of the Exodus Tradition, um, is a book that I also own. He has other books, but James Hoffmeyer would disagree with Coogan's archaeological uh, analysis. So, what was Paul Copan's book not about? Well, Is God a Moral Monster was not about the authorship of the book of Hebrews. Is God a Moral Monster was not about the fulfillment of Joshua's curse. Is God a Moral Monster was not about whether Rahab was a harlot and two Hebrew spies were eliciting something more than to stay at her hostel. Is God a Moral Monster was not about the archaeological differences on the site of Jericho or Ai. A proper review should either criticize the book title, which is, Is God a Moral Monster? And purpose, rather than engage in rabbit trails, the book is clearly not about or addressing. It's real simple. Look at the table of contents for what you should be reviewing. All right, let's go ahead and look at the table of contents, folks. Part one, neo-atheism. Well, neo-atheism and the Old Testament God well, maybe, uh, maybe he wouldn't have an issue with that, Mikey. And maybe he would agree with neo-atheism. Uh, part two, God, gracious master or moral monster. There's several subtitled uh, chapters there. Part three, life in the ancient Near East and in Israel. And there are many, many misogynistic women in Israel on page 101. Bride prices on page 110, polygamy, concubines, and other such questions. In fact, we discussed some of this content on my podcast, which is, once again, in the description. I do want to point out a couple of things that Mikey could have talked about, that Dr. Paul Copan talked about here. Since we're going to talk about Joshua, let's talk a little bit about Joshua, all right? Dr. Paul Copan, on page 170, which is not far from 
what Mikey was straggling around, but just failed to mention this. And I think because it doesn't fit his narrative. It doesn't help Mikey's argument. So, here he talks about Joshua. And he says, like his ancient Near Eastern contemporaries, Joshua used the language of conventional warfare rhetoric. Like his ancient Near Eastern contemporaries. Didn't I mention the fact that the Eastern culture is a little different? And, and the thing is, because we've been raised in the Western culture, we don't understand the East, let alone ancient Eastern civilizations and ancient Eastern cultures. But here, Dr. Paul Copan continues to write, This language sounds like bragging and exaggeration to our ears. Notice first the sweeping language in Joshua 1040. Thus Joshua struck all the land, the hill country and the Negev, and the lowland and the slopes and all their kings. He left no survivor, but he utterly destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua uses the rhetorical bravado language of his day, asserting that all the land was captured, all the kings defeated, and all the Canaanites destroyed. Yet, as we will see, Joshua himself acknowledged that this wasn't literally so. Scholars readily agree that Judges is literally linked to Joshua. Yet the early chapters of, jo of Judges, which incidentally repeat the death of Joshua, show that the task of taking over the land was far from complete. And Judges 2-3, God says, I will not drive them out before you. Earlier, Judges 121, 27-28 asserted that they did not drive out the Jebusites. They did not take possession. They did not drive them out completely. These nations remain to this day, Judges 121. The peoples who had apparently been wiped out reappear at the story, in the story. Many Canaanite inhabitants simply stuck around. So, basically, what Dr. Paul Copan is getting at is what we call the Jewish or Hebrew practice of hyperbole. And Joshua, who uh, they said was likely the author, used hyperbole. And what is hyperbole? Hyperbole is exaggeration. And it was common to exaggerate, as he said, as his ancient Near Eastern contemporaries, Joshua used the language of conventional warfare rhetoric. So why, why didn't you pick on that, Mikey? I mean, this is the substance of this book. You want to prove that God is a moral monster, despite Paul Copan's defense that God isn't a moral monster. Why not tackle the fact that Joshua used hyperbole. I don't know why he didn't. All right, here goes another one. Page 183. And I'm just picking on these two. Uh, because this is the substance of the book that Mikey did not do a review on. This is what the book's about. And Mikey instead went on rabbit trails. He proof texted. He, he, he eisegetical uh, usage of the text picked out, plucked out here and there, and arguments that had nothing to do with the book. Arguments, if you want to argue, argue archaeology, Paul Copan's not the guy to argue archaeology. How about picking on the other guys I just picked out, the other archaeologists? Go pick on their books if you want to have a difference on archaeology. So anyway, here's... a. Uh, uh, scripture and Archaeology, page 182. With its mention of gradual infiltration and occupation, the biblical text leads us to expect what archaeology has confirmed, namely that widespread destruction of cities didn't take place and that gradual assimilation did. Only three cities, citadels or fortresses, as we've seen, Jericho, which Paul Copan according to Mikey, is only a citadel, um, as we've seen, were burned, Jericho, Ai, and Hazor. 
all tangible aspects of the Canaanites' culture, buildings and homes, would have remained very much intact. Cities which you did not build, Deuteronomy 6, 10-11. This makes a lot of sense if Israel was to settle down in the same region, a lot less cleaner. This is the substance of this book, and Mikey chose to just gloss over it, to not talk about it. So anyway, here are the recommended resource. They are, they are in the description. Um, Garstang and Kenyon's Differences on Jericho. Uh, Dr. Bryant Wood is the one who talks about that. This is the YouTube for it. Uh, Secrets of the Bible, The Fall of Jericho with Dr. Bryant Wood. That's a YouTube. Biblical Archaeology, Joshua and Conquest of Canaan, Jericho, Hazor, and AI. Once again, I think that's Dr. Bryant also. That's on YouTube. Uh, did the Israelites conquer Jericho? A new look at the archaeological evidence. This is Dr. Bryant. This is a, an issue about pottery, which um, uh, Kathleen Kenyon did not have access to, which is, which is pivotal. And also the fact that the dig area that she used was limited. Uh, the Biblical City of AI presented by Tim Riddle. And he, I think, is a pastor who has been on a couple of digs. And um, uh, is there evidence of the conquest at AI? And this is, I believe, uh, uh, I forgot his name. He, he's the one of the physicists. Another good book I recommend is this book, Dr. David Lamb, which I also have in the video archives. God Behaving Badly is the God of the Old Testament, Angry, Sexist, and Racist. And um, I have that interview of Dr. David Lamb. In fact, we talked about Jephthah's daughter and how Jephthah made a promise to give the first person out of his house as a sacrifice to Yahweh if he won this battle. He won the battle, and here comes his daughter. Now, this is really important. When you read the Old Testament, and this is why biblical hermeneutics is important, because a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses don't know how to read the Bible, like Mikey. You see, the Bible has books that are apocalyptic and should be read as apocalyptic literature. There is poetic literature and should be read as poetic literature. And then there is historical literature, which should be read like a morning newspaper. If you read, for example, in the Washington Post that some senator shot uh, some guy on the street, are you going to blame the Washington Post writer for recording that story about what the senator did? Or, God forbid, if the Washington Post says Donald Trump dropped a, a profanity-laced tirade, is it the Washington Post problem, and, and should they receive the blame for reporting that Donald Trump gave a profanity-based tirade? No. Historical literature should be read in the literal sense that it is given. It is history. When Jephthah promised to the Lord that he would give his daughter as a sacrifice, which he did, more than likely, he gave her as a burnt sacrifice. Was it God's responsibility because Jephthah put his foot in his mouth and Jephthah made good on his promise? No. Now, God could have said, no, I don't want that. There's no indication in the text that it says that God was pleased with Jephthah giving his daughter as a burnt sacrifice. Nowhere in the text it says that. But people who don't know how to read the Bible, who want to assume and assert information into the text, which is called eisegetical reading of the text, is when you take a text and you imply meaning into the text instead of deriving the meaning from the text. If God never says, I'm pleased with Jephthah's daughter as a sacrifice, why should we assume so? And Mikey does that quite often. He makes lots of assumptions. All righty. All right, well, um, 
no, the the ball guy with his hands. No, the 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 the, the tall. No, there was a tall. Oh, hello, Paula. There was a tall ball guy. He was Jordan Maxwell. Uh, the other guy was Anton LaVey, and, and he had the he had the Unka cross, the Egyptian towel. So, um, anyway, uh, I see that there's a lot of action that was happening. <laughs> All righty. All right, let's see. All right, Franklin, to, to answer you, uh, uh, giving a rebuttal is not an attack. Uh, just like, why does Mike and Kim keep attacking the Watchtower Bible and Track Society? How about that? Um, but no, they're giving rebuttals to the Watchtower Bible and Track Society. So why do we treat the Watchtower Bible and Track Society differently as a cult? When we have Mike and Kim displaying the same tactics that the Watchtower Society does. What's the difference between an XJW who starts a cult and a Jehovah Witness who is in a cult? There is no difference. All righty. Well, I see that there's a lot of people here said certain things and I just okay I just gave this it was 50 minutes long 51 minutes long and people can watch it as their leisure and you can decide what you want with it but uh, I'm going to say that anyone who attacks Christians okay how about this Frank ask Mike and Kim why do they need to attack Christians why do they have to continue to attack Paul Copan or attack me or attack other Christians or attack the Bible? Why can't they preach their religion without having to denigrate somebody else's religion? How about that? I don't have to tell you how, how awful your religion is to talk about how beautiful my Jesus is. I can talk about how beautiful my Jesus is all along and never ever wind up talking about how evil your religion is. But in the need to expose falsehood, if someone wants to go ahead and attack Christianity, they have to be willing to take the rebuttal back. And if they can't take the rebuttal, then as I say, he who lives in glass houses should throw no stones. And with that, I close today's end stream. I end this stream today. The, the facts show that Mikey did not review Paul Copan's book. He nitpicked it. He used straw men. He used proof text. He used eisegesis to read into it. But he never, ever answered the question about why is God a moral monster? And on that note, I close today's stream. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Bye-bye.